is Isadora Jimenez and I work in the Earth Sciences Department. And I have the pleasure to introduce you today to Dr. Asander Sinclair. And she's philosopher and sociologist and director of the Digital Assurance Research Center in DMV Group in the area of research and development. And of course, she's also senior advisor in the Earth Sciences Department here at BSC. She has over 25 years of experience in on user-driven and solution-oriented research for global challenges in the interface between sustainable development and climate change, but more recently also on providing trust on digital technologies and leveraging this for sustainable development. Dr. Lara Sinclair uh, was also IPCC lead author for the FIFA Second Seven report on impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. And over her career, she has always given a strong focus on the design and direction of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approaches, which is one of the key aspects that she brings to the Earth Sciences Department. Asuni is a member of the Advisory Committee of the Sustainability in the Digital Age Initiative of Future Earth and member of the Advisory Committee for Sustainable Development of the Catalan Government. And currently, she is member of the Horizon Europe Mission Board for Climate Change Adaptation and Societal Transformation. And well, today she is going to provide us further insights on mission-oriented research and Horizon Europe missions. And I leave to Asun for, for her speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isa. And I hope you are all hearing me well and seeing my slides. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. And um, I want to talk about um, my experience. So I want to talk about what is a Horizon Europe and emissions. And I also want to talk about my experience on, on, on the process, uh, as well as uh, perhaps also sharing some reflections on this idea of mission-oriented science, primarily because it's not only the European Commission, but I think many other research funders are paying attention uh, to this. And uh, I will make some reflections on the, the problems of implementing this mission-oriented science plans. And I would like to conclude today drawing some recommendations on the potential role of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center uh, in all this. And I hope to engage in a dialogue uh, with all of you. So Horizon Europe is something all of you know very well, uh, follows and has substituted uh, Horizon 2020. And one of the key innovations uh, of this new program at the commission level is the creation of the missions. Um, you will see that in terms of money, it's only one percentage of the money of pillar two uh, in the overall sort of funding package of Horizon Europe. But I believe that in terms of ideas and in terms of understanding of science and especially and very much in particular, understanding the role of science in society, I think it's a great influence and it's going to perhaps influence quite a lot, certainly the calls on pillar two, but perhaps uh, more generally other parts and other pillars of Horizon Europe. So what are the missions? This is an idea that in, emerges uh, from both political and substantive um, ideas uh, that were put forward by a series of committees that I will show you. But basically there are two things uh, that are said in this slide that I think really define them, right? So one is that you want to relate European research and innovation much better to society, and in particular, much better to citizens' needs and to the needs of the world today. And on the other hand, this is important to also pay attention to, I think the commission had an enormous amount of interest in making sure that there is a visibility and impact of the research in society and in all societal actors, including demonstrating the value of the investments that governments make into research and what we get out of it. And this idea of impact, all of you who are probably already preparing uh, uh, proposals for Horizon Europe, you can see that the notion of impact has become much more important now than it already was in Horizon 2020. So I think there is this important political concerns that the commission wants to make sure they demonstrate the value of investments in research and innovation to society. As I said, this doesn't come out of the blue. It has been cooking for quite some time. 
It starts with the LAMI report, which was uh, produced in 2012, which was about investing in the European future that we want. So the idea that you look at the future that we want, and then you roll back the type of research that you need. Eventually, with uh, bringing in Mariana Matsukato, uh, economist in the UK, uh, and I will say a lot more about her work uh, later on, where she really put forward this mission-oriented research and innovation in the European Union, and she was extremely successful in making sure that the former um, EC and Parliament really approved that. And then more recently in 2019, um, she put together also an important document about governing missions in the European Union, where a lot of examples of what missions may look like could be uh, seen, and also quite a lot of indications on how these missions need to be governed. But I see now, after two years working on these, have crawled quite easily some of them in the implementation plans that the Commission is preparing for implementing the missions. The Green Deal, which was in the planning as well, and comes in a sense, launch, is launched after uh, the, the missions were, were launched, um, becomes important, becomes important because as you are about to see, four of the missions are really intrinsically connected to many of the goals of the Green Deal. So the Green Deal gives a central role to the missions and at least, the Commission says they see the missions as implementation mechanisms of the sort of broader uh, political and, and, and social ambition that the Green Deal is. The connections are not very clear at a programmatic level, and I don't think they are clear at the implementation level, or at least not yet, but the political <laughs> will is there. There are five mission areas. Uh, we were told when we were appointed to this, and I, I'm a member of the board on the adaptation to climate change. One, we were told that these are just the first ones and that the idea is to test how this goes and eventually pick up other key challenges and create new mission areas. And what are these uh, missions uh, supposed to do? So they're intended to achieve in very, very ambitious and inspirational goals. That's why they are the moonshots. Um, they are supposed to provide very clear direction and be targeted, measurable, and time bound. So whether one can achieve the first thing with the second, that's much more difficult, as you will see. Um, a lot of effort and emphasis on the impact for society and for policy making, which will lead to a lot of necessary connections at the local and the national level in member countries. And then the last key element is this idea that the commission wants to make sure in doing these missions, in doing the research and innovation and the actions around them, we engage with citizens and that the citizens become a lot more than simply doing citizen science. It's about engaging citizens in debates that are, can, can be named as democratic deliberation in co-designing, in the actual co-design of the, the missions in the, in the implementation and the execution of the missions, and also in evaluating or assessing the missions uh, towards the end. The, each mission has its own mission board, which is a group of experts, um, scientists, but also uh, we have seen in many of the missions, people who come from government, or uh, participants that come from the private sector or even from civil society organizations. So these missions have been working for over a year and a half in preparing what is called the scoping documents. And all the scoping documents or reports are all available online. And each has created this big ambition, ambitionary idea. The one on soil is about ensuring 75% of soils are healthy by 2030 for food, people, nature, and climate. The one on cities proposes to create 100 climate neutral cities by 2030, and very much focus on the idea that those are cities by or so designed for the citizens and also with the purpose of serving citizens. The third mission on oceans is called Mission Starfish 2030, and it's about restoring our ocean and waters. And then we have the one on cancer and because of the importance for, D, for BSE, I have a slide that explains more details on that 
And then I will say, of course, a little bit more about the one that I participated at Climate Resilient Europe. So when you look at the text uh, of, the, of the Council mission, um, they focus very much on understanding cancer, the risk factors and impact. And the idea is that by 2030, more than 3 million lives are safe, living longer and better. And this is about understanding and ensuring equitable access. And it has these three pillars in the figure, which are about prevention, they are about diagnosis and treatment, and they are about the quality of life of cancer patients. And for all of you who are interested in this topic, again, you can find the full document and a lot more information for this mission in the website of the commission. Let me just say a few words on the Horizon Europe mission, climate adaptation and societal transformation, and explain a little bit also this convoluted name that we have. What is the vision? The vision is to accelerate the transition to a climate prepared and resilient Europe. And it's about turning the absolutely urgent and needed challenge of adapting to climate change into an opportunity to make Europe more resilient, climate prepared and fair. We had enormous amounts of discussions as to, to what extent we need to focus on adaptation without focus on mitigation. And in the end, we use the terminology of resilience in order to convey that we cannot see an adapted and prepared Europe unless it's both adapted, but also adapted in the sense that we are shifting towards a green future. And in that sense, again, it's a fundamental piece for the Green Deal that this mission can support the vision of the Green Deal. We have massive, massive objectives. Prepare in this pyramid way, illustrating that the three objectives build one on top of the other. So at the basis, you have the idea that we need all citizens, communities, and regions to understand and to also prepare and also manage climate risk such as heat waves, forest fires, droughts, floods, storms, and diseases, or many others. And this is one of the bases where you will see that the work that we do in the Earth Sciences Department is fundamental because it really is underpinned under the idea that citizens, communities, and regions have the necessary climate information in order to be prepared for understanding and managing those risks, which is definitely not the case. So a lot of basic science is going to have to go in that pillar in order to make it happen. But a lot of it is also about making the information salient and making sure that the information is really understood and suitable for those that need to use it. In the middle is the massive piece around accelerating the transition to a resilient future, which is about picking and choosing 200 communities and regions that they are going to have to design and have foresight of a vision for those pathways that are going to take us to that future of resilience. And also about developing the enabling conditions and the solutions necessary to do that. And then on the top, the idea is that we will, uh, or the commission will sort of distill, let's say a series of winners, which will become those hundred demonstrators that will help in upscaling solutions that can trigger transformations and develop enabling conditions and solutions at a larger scale. Underpinning a lot of this is the idea that they will be doing what is called the twinning approach, which is uh, regions or communities that are much more advanced and prepared will pair with those that are least prepared and help them out, raise them up. I said that we settled quite a lot and it was, this is the, 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 the result of a lot of discussions on the term resilience. And what, but what, what does resilience means? Uh, for us in the text, we understood climate resilience to be about three different and interrelated things. The resilience of environmental systems with a commitment to long-term sustainability and also the precautionary and do no harm principles. Because a lot of, uh, bad things happen with good intentions, and we know that. In the middle is the fundamental piece that resilience is about the resilience of social and economic systems with a very strong commitment to equity, social and gender justice, to engage children and youth, and the idea of leaving no one behind. And then lastly, it's also about the resilience of political systems 
with a commitment to inclusiveness, deliberation, shared values, solidarity, and respect for diversity. So it's really quite a very ambitious set of goals that are proposed in this, um, in this scoping document. And the idea is that we will do that in relation to key community systems that are about regenerating community and social infrastructure. So one focus uh, on that critical infrastructure uh, across Europe. Another one on protecting human health and well being. Then another one focus on nature and ecosystem services. There is another one on water management, and there is another one on rural landscapes and sustainable food systems. And by now, many of you may be asking, well, wait a second, but didn't you just tell us that there is another mission on oceans and another on land, another on cities? How do they integrate with one another? The idea that we see is that the climate mission is seen as very focused on adaptation and resilience, whereas the others, the cities, the land use, is the one on health, on water, et cetera, are more focused on being uh, tailored towards mitigation uh, actions. But nevertheless, there is going to be a need to interconnect these missions. Perhaps what is also important, uh, for me is very important, I it really engage quite a lot in building this, this block of the scoping uh, document is that to talk, we talk about these key topics that are important for most European regions, but we also need to focus direct attention on creating enabling conditions. So one of them is providing data, the necessary climate data, but also other types of data, knowledge and digital services, underpinning the work in each of these community systems. We also need to work at facilitating inclusive and deliberative governance. Maybe for some governments and for some parts of Europe, the engagement of citizens is something that is already happening, certainly is happening in Spain and in Catalonia, but in other parts of Europe, this doesn't come so easily. So there's going to be the need to really work at facilitating that deliberative governance. Also about improving education and understanding of behavioral change. A lot of this is about changes in behavior, not only individual behavior, but also social behavior, corporate behavior, and organizational behavior. And also the idea that we have now quite a lot of activities around the circular economy. We will need to sort of strengthen these local circular economies because they will become uh, the force or the enabling condition one more time, underpinning all the other community systems and certainly the issue of funding and finances and resources. And I will say in a few moments that very clearly Horizon Europe cannot in itself fund all this work. So this takes me to the implementation plans that I wanted to uh, present uh, to you a little bit where the thinking is. Um, and I was telling to each other, I'm not sure to what extent uh, these are public or not, but I think uh, I, can, I can present that to you. So right now, our, our work as, let's say, experts in those mission boards is in a sense, uh, we have taken two steps back. We were the owners of the scoping documents. Now the owners of the implementation document has become the commission. The commission has appointed mission managers for each of these missions. And these mission managers are uh, not people from the research and innovation directorate. They are people from the corresponding directorate. So the idea is to make sure that the missions are anchored in each of the DGs. So for example, our mission, of course, is anchored in the climate DG and we have uh, Clara de la Torre, which is actually an Spanish officer in the EU, uh, who is the deputy director of that DG being the manager of this mission. And the, the secretariat of the mission is also working at an implementation plan that some of us have given input, but basically they are trying now to make sure that this works and it's not that easy, right? So the idea, uh, and I will go a little bit fast to this, it's a very heavy slide, but I just wanted to show you that we thought that getting the scoping document was a lot of work, but doing this implementation plan is a lot more complicated. So we decided that we will start with the middle objective, which is understanding what are the partner regions and understanding what are the communities and select those first in order to establish the mission 
and also establish the governance structures that are going to make the mission going forward. So it will be, again, around the co-design, co-implementation, and co-evaluation as phases, but also in these different horizontals. The second thing we are working on is trying to build up an implementation platform that can support those regions and facilitates the key processes. So this is about supporting the regions with establishment of governance and support structures, but also facilitating for regions, co-creating the vision of transformative pathways, or for example, with the management of the portfolio of innovation actions. So there has to be that sort of implementation platform supporting this. And then it will be about looking into different communities of practice, which is just one way of saying that there will be um, different topics, one of them, for example, data, but all of them providing data and knowledge services to the regions that can, for example, support the development of the vision pathways that can prepare uh, providing assessment, an assessment framework and access to data and models and different, and different other topics. And then lastly, of course, there will be a component on knowledge sharing where all regions and community are being reached beyond the partner regions and general sharing of knowledge and sort of scaling up and co-learning across the different um, elements. In terms of the governance, this is not yet done, but uh, again, they are working very hard on creating a basis for mission management uh, with a central governance uh, and mission support structures like that implementation platform, but also to create a system where there will be consultation and advice available, uh, a governance that is not only top down, but also distributed. So this is going to have to be negotiated with the member countries and also making sure that we don't reinvent the wheel or that the commission doesn't reinvent the wheel and that what we use are established procedures, established systems uh, to be leveraged for making sure that the mission is being governed. I wanna say something about budget and financial strategy. So the idea is that Horizon Europe puts 1 billion euro per mission from their money that they have. And this is going to be money that will translate into a specific mission call. So for example, there is a small one, 5 million only euros that was sort of shipped out of the door very quickly, but a lot more of the different calls from the mission will be coming. So that will be the 1 billion euro, but this is only going to finance a little tiny part of this big, big plan, right? Because with that money, you cannot achieve neither objective one, nor objective two, nor objective three. So when the mission uh, secretariat, we ask, so where is the money coming from? Uh, the idea is there will be, there has to be all sorts of other funds that those proposals that are going to be successful need to come up with uh, a, a financing plan. They need to be rooted in existing national plans. They need to be linked up, for example, to the, to the next generation funding for the recovery funds, to existing planning, et cetera. And also ideally uh, leverage funds and co-funding from the private sector. Um, so this is just indicative and that everybody knows that the Horizon Europe funds, although it sounds like a lot of money, is only going to be able to finance a little bit. And the idea is that this is like the catalyst or the push that with this money, you start of, sort of rolling processes that eventually leverage funding and, 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 and link up with goals and with ambitions that are already at the country level, at the local level, and at the cooperation level in Europe. So as I said, the mission-oriented topics and logic is just crawling all over Horizon Europe. So it will be these individual mission calls, but I, we, we also see the influencing of other calls in the Horizon Europe. We have not been allowed to write the calls of other parts of Horizon Europe, but there is a lot of suggestions for where are the areas that we need more research, basic research, not mission only, but normal research uh, underpinning this. Um, the key role of the impact, the key role of citizen engagement, and certainly the key role of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity is also sprawling all over Horizon Europe. And many people will be looking at how these missions are working in order to also continue learning as we move in the next seven years with Horizon Europe. 
I want to say now just a few words about this mission-oriented research and innovation and the moonshot, right? This idea that um, metaphorically, of course, is a technology in context, but it's also an ambitious and exploratory project that often is undertaken without any expectation of near-term profit profitability or benefit, right? Uh, is the idea that, okay, we go to the moon and we have no idea how to get there, but we have decided we are going to the moon. And this is interesting uh, because you want those projects to address the huge problem. Uh, you want to leverage the interest and the political motivation for doing this and of course the financing. But the analogy with the, the, the Apollo mission, which is where all this comes from, uh, is that science and technology moonshots are incomplete, only as science and technology. The Apollo program, just reflect on this, right, was completely politically driven. Uh, it was about a competition between the US and, 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 and Russia. It was science and innovation was leveraged not only from the usual science and innovation uh, public systems, but a lot of it from private actors and the role of the private sector was fundamental in making this happening. But it was poorly conceived from a social perspective. It was not really about um, a better world. It was the inspirational goal of really uh, the race to space. And once the politics move into something different, then the, 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 space, the space race drive. Now we have another one, that's another discussion, right? We wanna go to Mars, but the situation is completely different, but it was displaced by other earthly political concerns. And I think this is important for us to know because all this sounds fantastic, but if you don't have that political support, it's not going to happen. And to me, what I think is the most interesting lesson from the idea of looking into the Apollo program is that the most inspirational outcome was that picture of the earth rise. I think it comes now, right? And, and, and that was not, that was like, a, people didn't, didn't, as far as I have not done proper research, just a little bit of high level, it was not really the goal to get to that inspiration uh, that led to a massive mindset transformation and a whole generation of people thinking about planet Earth in a completely different way. So the lesson I think is that we cannot have moonshots without a proper understanding of the social and human dimensions because these eventually are the ones that really sustain the political drive. So if you leave it up to only the finances and the politics, it's not going to hold. And we need to create this sort of uh, Earthrise moments, I think, with the, with the missions in the European Commission at the moment. And I think Mariana Mazzucato, who really inspired this work, uh, knows that very well, except that what she says, and this is her latest book, uh, is that, of course, we need to work together, public and private sectors, towards the common good. But this is not going to happen unless we fundamentally restructure capitalism and make it inclusive, inclusive sustainable and driven by innovation that tackles those problems. So it means changing government tools and culture. It is about creating new markers of corporate governance. You need to completely reorganize that and also ensuring that corporation society and governments coalesce to a share and common goal. So it tells you a little bit that this is not a little tiny way of doing research. Uh, the aspiration is to really change the world and change the key actors that drive that. So we need a lot more research, I think, on those social and human dimensions. I want to conclude uh, by saying a few, a few words uh, about what we have been doing in Spain. It has been quite involved uh, and organized uh, in COP25, a meeting where we invited Matsukato and colleagues uh, who were in the other mission boards uh, uh, representing Spain. And, 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 and yeah, we started up, I think, quite well, quite supportive. We have also created a mirror committee uh, where some of us are there. Paco Dobla sits in that committee and we have representation from business and from civil society organization and other researchers. And now the question is, how can we work at a national level to make sure that this implementation is important? So you can look at it from the perspective of these new research funds, but then on the other hand, is how are we going to make it work at, at a country level? And what is the relevance of the work that we do at BSC? I, I think uh, to me, of course, it's very clear in relation to, to climate change. 
all the elements of the meeting the objective one, but all the others are underpinned by the presumption that we have available climate data. And also that we are able to provide climate services to all societal stakeholders in a way that they are salient and relevant and credible for all of them. So quite a lot of work for us. There is also quite a lot of work in relation to issues related to societal transformation, such as, for example, closing non knowledge gaps and mature quality assurance and standardization to create a governance regime that really facilitates uptake by public and private actors of climate information and climate services. We also need to fast track contributions from the social and the human sciences and bridge those gaps that are between the sort of more theoretical knowledge with uh, other types of needs in climate action, such as narratives of empowerment or articulating participatory and even anticipatory foresight as to what are those futures that we ambition or addressing issues such as subjective perceptions of risk and even I will say denialism uh, of climate uh, and its impacts. We also need a lot of transdisciplinary research. We need to reach out not only to the other disciplines, but we also need to reach out to other societal actors and ensure that the non-scientific knowledge and interests that they represent are really truly integrated in material uh, climate services um, uh, from us, for many different reasons and for many different sectors. I will say that the mission on cancer has quite a lot of importance for a lot of the work that is already being done in the life sciences unit uh, department at BSC. I also think that the BSC as an organization uh, can have huge uh, contributions uh, from all departments and also on transversal topics relevant uh, for all the missions, not only the one on climate. And that is the critical importance of high performance computing and data-driven solutions, the role of artificial intelligence, the visualization of complex information and many other themes that maybe you can just raise uh, during the Q&A. I just wanted to say a few words uh, and I will just finish that in this slide, which comes from one officer uh, high level uh, in the commission that I, I saw in, in, in one presentation, it sort of created the opportunities to address EU policies from the lens of a combination of artificial intelligence and, and climate change. And here you see uh, this idea that it's about the citizens, it's about defense and security, it's about AI and it's about uh, European democracy. It all sort of can be articulated uh, to make sure that we can really leverage the combination of digital technologies and, and, and not only AI, but many other digital technologies and high performance computing uh, to make sure that we respond to these needs. And just to conclude, I think that it's very interesting to see in the world two trends that are really, really picking up quite a lot. On the one hand, you have organizations like the International Science Council, who just had very recently a meeting that I participated and other colleagues, Isa also was attending that meeting, uh, with all the major funders of the world. We are talking about the head of the National Science Foundation in the United States. Uh, there was um, a, a Paquet from the European Commission was there, the director of the Norwegian Research Council. And they were trying to, to sell them this idea that we need missions for sustainability. And then in parallel, because the ISC is also a fundamental piece of this, there is quite a lot of actors, quite powerful, working on maturing the topic of sustainability in the digital age or digital environmental sustainability with the United Nations very involved, the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, uh, leading this coalition for digital environmental sustainability, the German Environmental Office, and then the work that we did in Future Earth is also part of this. And what is very interesting because that they have created a platform and you can see now that there is uh, all sorts of smaller initiatives around how to leverage digital technologies for the goals of sustainability and resilience from all over the world. So I think that we at BSC are in a perfect place to respond to all that. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. And I look forward to engaging in QA and a with all of you now. And to you, Isa. Thank you very much, Asun, for, for your presentation and your insights.
And I'd like to ask the people in, in the meeting uh, if you have any questions. If not, uh, I, I have known Asim for quite some years and working together. So I, I have some questions that I'm sure will be relevant for everyone, but please uh, let us know if you have any question. If not, I, I will start breaking the ice. And I will start with the climate part, but for sure, I think it, it will be relevant for everyone to, to be thinking broader than just the Earth Sciences Department. But for the climate mission, how do we ensure that BSC Earth Sciences is really prepared for, for the mission calls and everything related in, in Horizon Europe? Well, great question. I, th I think we are already doing that, right? I think we need to strengthen our, we are already very good at interdisciplinarity, but I think we need to strengthen that. We need to work uh, together across the different units in the different uh, sections. I think our work on climate services is a fundamental piece, uh, and, and it, we are already say, on, the, on the radar uh, as key actors. I believe that perhaps two areas deserve more attention, and that is that we need more social sciences, and, and, and especially the social sciences that are able to speak to our more technical staff, right? Uh, it's, it's very important that also the social scientists have, let's say, the attitude to collaborate. Uh, very often that is uh, not necessarily the case. So all the, all the weight on us and the responsibility on us as well. And I think we need to learn a lot more about this citizen engagement. Um, I mean, you know, the work that you do is uh, in, in, in our unit is, is, is quite good, but I think we, we really need to prepare more on that. And lastly, I think that all of us, and probably we are not the only organization, but many others need to be thinking quite ahead, independently of the, the individual call, how do we really pin down this impact? Uh, because it's not clear, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's an ambition that the commission has there, but how do we formulate the impact? So to be much more prepared of understanding what is the impact of our ideas, of our research in society. And also, of course, the more difficult part, how do you measure it in a way that is you know, tangible and you can put it in an application? And maybe yeah. you have other ideas for what else do we need? Oh, for sure. But, um... The finally, uh, impact is really something that we have to move forward. And I'm the first one to say that we need more social scientists because I'm the one trying to, to bring as many as, as we can. And, and for sure in climate, it has been quite obvious, but I think this is something that is uh, a tendency and it's going to happen in any other field. I mean, it's uh, as relevant for life sciences uh, or even for engineering, really. I mean, it's yes. really taking the human dimension of technology is really important. Absolutely. And, but regarding to this part of impact, um, one of the things that we have seen in, in, in the Air Sciences Department and in climate services specifically is the importance of mixing and getting not just the research world, but then bringing also private companies, bringing the users and the, 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 the users of this information, the society into the equation. And for these hybrid consortiums are really important. So what do we need here at BSC or in general to, to generate more hybrid consortiums? And because I think this is something that the mission requires, right? Right, right, absolutely. I think the mission, <clears throat> and probably this will scroll more and more and more to Horizon Europe calls. I mean, let me be bold. I think um, very often we leave up to our the, the individual researchers to bring their own networks or to reach out to their own networks. But at an institutional level, I think some organizations are already, and usually in, in a research institute and university, so let's say the, the public relations with uh, different organizations is up to the directors. But I think maybe we need an, a, a, at the institutional level, a unit that actually works on this, uh, not only for our own uh, department, but for all of them, right? So it's more about the relations with different societal actors. So, so, so we, we end up, um, creating channels of communication, uh, like, I don't know, business, uh, business, um, business and administration uh, universities usually have ongoing dialogues with companies because then they will place their students to do an internship in the companies and so on, right? So they have these protocols and established processes for those interactions. So maybe that's what we need also at an institutional level as BSC, 
to have a department that is able to help in creating these connections rather than leaving it uh, to be, let's say, individual contacts that the researchers do in a punctual manner to respond to a particular call. Mm -hmm. And then if we move a bit uh, away from, from climate and then, well, it's Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the HPC. Uh, well, first, I mean, we're having a conversation. I mean, we, we have many of them and I, and I love them, but I don't know if anyone has any specific question or do you want to raise or comment something on everything? In the discussion. Then please feel free to 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 interrupt, to write, and even to to switch on your camera and and say something. I, okay, I see. Hi, Mark. Mark. <laughs> Maybe my, my question is more about what real life for project managers, which is how you how you. Uh, how can we find the, the, the funding opportunities here? Because I saw that in the graphs for, for the missions of in Horizon Europe, there are right now five CSA calls, but I don't know in the future if there were any other kind of funding, not only from the Horizon Europe program, but also from national calls or something like that. Mar, you, you, you mean in relation to the missions? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Specific I mean, calls for missions, but right. I'm not That's sure so, if, because right now those are kind of a preparation phase. Their preparation phase these and those calls. Are, yeah, these okay. calls are more for preparing the path for future calls. That, right? That's not right. Sure. So that there was an opportunity because this has been rushed, right? There was an opportunity. Oh, we can have five million for each mission, and yeah. then each secretariat very quickly put something very much related to creating the fundamental conditions. Because I mean many, many areas uh, of Europe are simply not prepared to even create uh, bids. But the idea, the idea is that member countries have a fundamental role to play here, not only with co-financing, but also with articulating the co-financing that will um, that articulate, that will help articulate those, um, those, those, uh, those, those bids, right? So quite a lot of expectations fall upon our colleagues who work uh, coordinating the relations between Spain and, 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 and Horizon Europe and the mission. So quite a lot of expectations on that. Also in, in terms of project management, I think it's, it's um, extremely important at the national level. I think the expectation, very important expectation, especially for countries that are going to receive or have we received? No, going to receive fundamentally largest amounts of money with the, with the recovery funds, that there is an alignment in the dispersation of that money with these goals for the mission. So, I mean, ideally, you will expect to see some of those funds to be given to prepare those bids, because you need quite a lot of you know, legwork. This is going to be a lot more work than simply putting together a proposal Right. You need a large, a large uh, consortium. You need to reach out to many partners, so it's not our usual work like we do in each of the departments bidding uh, for 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 uh, Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020 call. So I think quite a lot of expectations I think are related to this. Any kind of other European funding that gets to the national level should be put together in the pot to really enable. Uh, researchers and institutions and organizations that are not research but that are needed uh, for meeting those goals, whether it's cancer or the soils or, or climate to, 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 to support those, the, the, the process of building those consortiums that will, that will win. So the CSAs is just a tiny part. Yeah, so thank you. I guess at the end, that's why we talk about missions. So it's really to make it broader and bigger and not just uh, small initiatives, but something that encompasses. Uh... And, and inspire, inspire other actors, right? So, but, um, but so I don't think that, that it's going to be up to the individual researchers or the small research units of each research center. You need something that coordinates. So the, and then the risk, 
that many of us have already um, uh, mentioned again and again to the commission is that the risk that you have is that those countries and those organizations that are better organized are going to be the ones that are going to be winning all these funds uh, and still creating a bigger inequality that we have also because you know the areas that are more vulnerable are the ones you know all these sort of uh, cascade of negative things, uh, one building upon the other. So I think that that is what they are working on now, how to prevent that this whole process is captured by those actors that are more dominant and that are better prepared. Yeah, for sure. And also overarching aspect of the missions is the role of, of digital technologies. I mean, we, we live in the green transformation, but also in the digital transformation. Yes. And so how HPC or the role that BSC has could, could be fit, fitting into this picture, you know, to, to solve global challenges? I don't know. I mean, from what I can see, um, I don't know if we have any colleagues from the life sciences department. I think that a lot of the work that the life sciences department demonstrates the key potential of the BSC in other topics, certainly on the climate issues. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very positive and very optimistic uh, that we can play uh, a, a key role in, in terms of societal relevance, in terms of interaction, and in terms of leveraging big data and, 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 and the understanding of, of these uh, solutions. So I think, I think that that is a very nice example to see the potential. And again, I don't know the names and I cannot see the people. But if we have any colleague uh, in the life sciences department, I think maybe can say that I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't see anyone connecting. Um, I think we are a bit behind uh, the hour, but I would like maybe finish uh, the conversation uh, with last question. Um, I know it's like one step back, but. Um, you were lead author in the fifth section report uh, on the IPCC. And uh, right now we are like uh, months away from the launch of the, the sixth assessment report and where uh, the director of the department has a, a, a very important role. And I would like to know how, which is the link between these uh, IPCC reports and the missions and if Maybe going just to close it a bit more personal on how did your experience into, into working in these IPCC reports has shaped some of the ideas that you have been sharing today with us and in the mission? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, to me, being um, uh, one of the few social scientists uh, in, in, in the only working group that has any, uh, I think it's a little bit better in the sixth assessment now, was a big eye opener. So I learned the real urgency. So at the scientific level, I, I learned the real urgency of the issues and I learned the real danger of cascades of risks overlapping one on top of the other that we were facing. Um, and to me, it led to a massive change in my career because what I realized uh, is that we needed something else besides good science. That was the big lesson. The big lesson is that you need those, you need to really get your hands dirty uh, with the private sector, trying to really bring in the private sector by showing climate risk to private actors, to their supply chains, to the infrastructure uh, and so on. Uh, and, and also um, the big importance of engaging at a, at a policy and political level. So I changed careers. I move from academia to, to a consultant uh, company, um, expecting that I will be more able to do things uh, in the real world and, and to bring the science to action. So I think that was the last, the last push of focusing my attention on making sure that the science really serves those who need to use it and also that it empowers those who need to use it and to enter into a dialogue with other actors of society and to be engaged at a high level politically. So when Albert asked me whether I wanted to be for being a member of the mission board, I thought it was a brilliant idea. And I must say that I really have enjoyed very much uh, this because I think this is the right way to go. And it's not a coincidence that 
organizations like the International Science Council are picking up on the on the on the comment, right? That we want science to be, um, and this is not an argument against basic science, but we want to make sure that a substantive amount of the budgets that we give to science is for things that the world needs. Um, so I, I, I really completely agree with that. And I have participated extremely actively in this mission uh, in many of the topics. Perfect. I think this is the perfect message to, to close the session today. And I want to thank you, thank you, uh, Asun, for your time and for all the attendees for being here, hearing the conversation. And please, um, at any moment, maybe you didn't raise a question now, but you have something else to, to comment or you have something to add later, please contact us. And we are here at BSC and you can find our contact in, in the website. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you.